the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Well, Eric, after a bit of a run early in the week, we saw gold capped at 1250, knocked back below at the second half of the week, and silver knocked back towards 17, and actually early Thursday morning briefly dipped back below 17. And as we record here, it, a little after 4 Eastern here on Friday, silver is uh, closing the week right around 1720, and gold closing right around 1230. Um, so what's your take here on uh, the trading over the week and the, the second half of the week in particular as gold was knocked down after it had briefly cleared 1250? Yeah, we also saw a strength in the dollar at the same time when gold and silver were being taken down starting Wednesday. It looks like uh, you know, we have an uptick in demand coming out of Asia, and India is uh, once again talking about trying to restrict imports and uh, they're paranoid about their current accounts deficit and the uh, strength of their currency falling apart. So it, it's once again kind of like a standoff. Uh, we have the Asian demand picking up and supporting the market, and in particular when gold slipped below 1,200, there was a heck of a lot of buying in China. As it stands, uh, we'll probably be stuck in a trading range for a while until something happens. <laughs> what, what, what that may be is not 100% clear, um, but the demand continues to be high, so the market is tight, and it won't take much to move higher if we do have some kind of a catalyst. And the week prior, we saw the statements from uh, Fed Governor Bullard in St. Louis and then the uh, Fed Governor in uh, Sacramento and in the San Francisco district as well, talking about how it's possible that we'll have um, the need to have interest rates kept lower far longer than people expect and that there may be QE uh, launched yet again if inflation expectations remain as tame as they describe them. So, you know, we're kind of setting up a period where I believe that the asset prices and, and, and as far as the stock market goes and the general economy overall uh, is, has set up with lower oil, oil prices and so forth to basically see a burst going through the election and people are going to probably be surprised because uh, we have a setup where there's going to be a lot of uh, monies flowing into United States stock prices, you know, the equity market here. Um, and that is going to probably keep the powers that be somewhat less aggressive when it comes to gold because and silver for that matter. Um, so we may be in a period where we're just going to go through a tra trading range and, and uh, come through in the turn of the year where we would see more uh, pressure in the gold market and silver in turn, in part because it'll be reflecting expectations of uh, QE returning. <laughs> but any idea that the stock market is going to just roll over probably isn't uh, on the target because uh, there's just too many forces right now that will uh, add liquidity into the economy. And who knows, we may even have a decent Christmas season with the uh, extra money that consumers have in their pocket with this large decline in oil that's happened since July. So uh, in the very near term, uh, I'm not expecting any gigantic moves, more something that's just uh, kind of the status quo. And then, you know, turn of the year, we'll see some fireworks. In the physical market here this week, the second half of the the week, sales really picked up as prices dipped a bit. Not quite on uh, pace with the level of buying that we saw a couple of weeks ago when 17 was breached, but um, strong retail buying uh, continues. Uh, the U.S. Mint has updated their October sales totals. It's just shy of 4 million ounces now with a full week to go in October. Um, it looks like we have a chance to set uh, the the highest uh, sales for the month, which uh, up till now is 5.3 million in March. We had uh, the, the biggest one-week sales total uh, of the year. Silver Eagles sales continue to be extremely strong, and we're seeing it across the spectrum. The Canadian Mint is on allocation now. Premiums are rising. Uh, it's uh, supply tightens on the Silver Maples. Uh, and the same thing with private mints uh, with bars and rounds. Mints are backed up a week or two, and uh, premiums are rising somewhat. Nothing dramatic yet. We're not seeing premiums double or triple or anything, but they have started to rise, and I was um, chatting with Eric before the show here. wouldn't surprise me at all if next week's, if silver does dip back down under 17 into a 16 handle, 
things could tighten significantly fairly quickly just from where the market is right now. I'm not saying that silver will do that, but if it if it did do that, um, don't be surprised to see uh, physical supplies tighten uh, quite a bit more here. Yeah, and a moment ago we were talking about possible catalysts, and one of them could in fact prove to be the Swiss gold referendum. They're talking about backing their currency by 20% gold, and at this point, you know, there's not enough gold in the world for them to be able to source uh, that kind of a coverage to their currency. Um, but nevertheless, the referendum is on November 30th, and early indications are that uh, the yes vote is in the lead. So this could be pretty interesting to watch. You know, ultimately, not to you know, be too pessimistic, but I suspect what will happen will be something kind of similar to what happened with Germany, where they initially talked about bringing tons and tons of gold back and repatriated some from France and the UK and were only able to get five uh, metric tons out of the United States in 2013. And then ultimately, because of the lack of available gold to carry off what they told their public that they would do, they acquiesced to um, the Anglo-American financial establishment and basically said, okay, well, you know, you can keep it gold there in, in Fort Knox. Uh, we'll wink and nod and, you know, just assume that it's there and not push you guys any further. <laughs> and unfortunately, this probably something that's going to be pushed by uh, the Swiss establishment and their political leaders uh, in response to any yes vote uh, carrying the day, November 30th. But, um, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's actually really productive to see this kind of uh, awakening in Swiss um, public opinion about gold because, uh, you know, it just shows that at least some countries, some areas have a great affinity for gold. Swiss people are certainly among that, um, you know, fairly uh, described as such. So this, this could be a catalyst. It'll be fun to watch this develop over the coming month. One story here I want to touch on, Eric, um, and again, we were kind of chatting before the show that uh, regular listeners may recall that several weeks ago we had Gaz, uh, Bill Murphy on the show, and he was rather downcast uh, that day and was rather chiding with the silver miners and silver and gold miners that they don't stand up to uh, the manipulation and I think he said something like uh, they need to get some balls and stand up. A couple of weeks later here this week, fairly big announcement, primary silver miner First Majestic announced that they had suspended 35% of their Q3 silver production, which is a fairly significant amount, about 1 million ounces of their 2.7 million quarterly production. And uh, the CEO, Keith uh, Newmeyer, in uh, an interview this week, actually called for his uh, fellow compatriots and other silver miners to do likewise and hold back their production. And he actually made the statement that they need to form a, an OPEC-like cartel to force the end of the paper manipulation in silver. And uh, he sp- want to quote uh, a statement here he made it th- towards the end of the interview. Um, we all know the paper market has no representation to the physical market. And again, that's uh, Keith Newmeyer, the CEO of First Majestic Silver. Um, so rather interesting that uh, First Majestic is a uh, come out and make yeah. made the stand here. Eric. Keith has always been a great guy, uh, you know, visionary leader, and uh, his background is more in finance than uh, uh, geology, but his you know, understanding of the markets and willingness to speak out against the manipulation is you know, fantastic. I mean, he's been speaking out against it for years and is you know, a great example for other mining executives, and hopefully other mining executives will look to this and uh, embrace the idea because, frankly, the World Gold Council is a joke. Uh, Bill Murphy's criticism uh, criticism of them over the years are completely spot on. Uh, the trade organization is focused largely on trying to um, develop jewelry demand and has uh, put very little emphasis on building investment demand and their uh, reporting and computations of uh, what actual gold demand flows are over the course of the entire world are really suspect. And, you know, when, you know, when gold was revised by China's uh, uh, official stats from, uh, I forget what it was initially, but they moved it up to 1,054 metric tons. And at that point, it, it, I believe that was 2009, uh, you know, the World Gold Council just kind of uh, had egg on their face because all this the time prior they were unable to really recognize what was going on with Chinese gold, and they just reported whatever the Chinese uh, were 
officialdom's statements. So uh, you know, our hats are off to, to Keith. This is fantastic, and I hope that other executives in the industry take a look at the example. And th- it's a good idea. People sh- uh, should be talking more uh, in trade conferences or what have you to maybe coordinate a little bit more uh, discussions about withholding production or stockpiling uh, bullion, as Rob McEwen did with Gold Corp. It, it's something that its time has come. It'll be interesting to see whether this does gain any traction among any of the other miners, as certainly this isn't the first time the idea has been uh, thrown out there. Um, Eric Sprott, I want to say a year or two ago, um, issued a letter and a call to uh, miners, and if I recall, was it Endeavor that uh, did follow up on that? Yeah, I believe they did Uh, withhold some production. But Eric Sprott's call really didn't gain any widespread traction at all, so it'll be interesting to see if one of their industry brethren making the call and stepping up to the plate and holding back. That's, it's a fairly significant amount of production, 35% yeah. or a million ounces. Um, over, overall, the whole scheme of the global silver market, one million ounces isn't that much, but for First Majestic, 35% of their production is a significant Yeah, and in amount. the interview that you referenced, Keith had spoken about how there's a balancing act that he has to do as an executive where, you know, this is the perfect time where you'd want to invest in future production, you know, maybe even company executive with free cash flow and uh, a decent-sized corporate treasury would be considering acquisitions at this point. So you know, it's a trade-off between growing the business versus uh, stockpiling an undervalued asset and refusing to play along with the machinations of the paper market worldwide. But uh, that being said, there are enough uh, miners out there, mining companies, that have positive cash flow. And then were they to take this kind of an action collectively, it would have a profound impact. And the other thing, too, it's not just a matter of um, you know, making a statement about the supply and demand um, being shaped by paper prices that are just disconnected from the physical reality of mining. It's also um, uh, an opportunity for the mining companies to press their case and make the case about this manipulation that's ongoing and visible to anyone who cares to look. I mean, like I had said when we were discussing this issue with Bill Murphy, if 30 mining companies all sat around the table and held a press conference about withholding production, that kind of a, a public uh, uh, statement would be pretty profound. It would not be able to be ignored by the financial media. I mean, sure, they'd spin it. They'd try to you know, basically paint the CEOs as being ridiculous, that they're hurting their shareholders because they're not following their fiduciary responsibility, can cash flow up and on and on. You know, I mean, you can imagine all the kind of ways in which the biased financial media would try to paint something like that. But the bottom line is that the debate would be out there. And with uh, 10, 20, 30 CEOs holding a press conference, uh, that's something that uh, the media couldn't ignore and that would expose new people to this whole uh, reality of manipulation in this particular market. Well, Eric, with all the the market focus on Ebola lately, um, the geopolitical crisis came roaring back um, to the forefront today with uh, Vladimir Putin's comments in Sochi, meeting uh, with some Asian princes, I think the Prince Al Nayan of Abu Dhabi, um, and he made some pretty pointed comments uh, regarding the U.S. and the U.S. dollar um, what's your take on just the, the geopolitical situation right now with uh, the Russia and U.S. conflict? Russia is continuing to be isolated, and that really isn't productive for the U.S. in the long run, but it's kind of like this contradictory waltz that we're doing because uh, at this stage, uh, the developments are such that China and Russia find it in their political interest to continue to diversify, diversify away from the dollar um, and the tensions that uh, continue uh, will only push them further in that direction. So seeing the you know, Putin meetings with Saudi Arabia, and now uh, uh, we're seeing them you know, doing more discussions uh, with various Middle Eastern partners uh, and, and possible you know, relationships that they're trying to work, uh, all point to the probability that we're going to see more and more energy, in particular priced in currencies other than the U.S. dollar on one-off basis contracts, you know, uh, bilateral uh, swaps and so forth. So um, it, it's just an ongoing story that we've talked a lot about over the course of this entire year, and uh, nothing's going to slow
slow it down. That's really the bottom line. The Russians are looking at moving 100% of their trade outside of the dollar zone. And over time, these uh, moves are going to have a pretty profound impact on the dollar and gold and so forth. So um, it, you know, a lot of people look at this as something that's going to happen very quickly, that you know we'll have kind of an overnight reset when it comes to currencies and maybe sovereign debt being also in the mix in terms of you know, governments uh, taking advantage of that and, and renegotiating. And, and that may, in fact, happen at some point in the next three years or so. Uh, but uh, it, it'll most likely be kind of an evolutionary process over time with periods of punctuated uh, friction uh, driven by asset market scares. So. Anyway, it is interesting. Now, and I would say certainly uh, Putin's comments were fairly punctuated today. Uh, um, a couple of the quotes here. Um, he warned that the U.S. dollar is losing trust as reserve currency. Um, he said that the uh, the, uh, the U.S. exerts a unipolar world-like dictatorship over other countries. Um, the U.S. calls itself, uh, or the U.S. is basically a self-appointed leader. Um, and concluded by basically saying that the U.S. cannot continue to humiliate its partners forever. Um, so uh, fairly pointed um, remarks from Putin, especially after the recent um, period of, I don't know if you call it calm, but not quite as much uh, um, escalated volleys back and forth between uh, in the U.S. and Russia. Yeah, and we expected that there would be this period of calm because the winter is coming, and the you know issue of 40 percent of Europe's gas coming from Gazprom uh, is something that just can't be dodged. So basically, what we have now is uh, kind of a standoff, and the and, you know, fighting in the eastern section of Ukraine has also uh, calmed a bit because, in large part, they were the Kiev forces were getting their butts kicked. <laughs> That the you know the local forces that are Russia sympathetic um, were fighting for their own sovereignty and their own way of life. They had an actual um, moral high ground for their cause, so to speak. The people really believed in it. They were being attacked. Uh, so anyway, uh, it, it remains to be seen what happens ultimately with Ukraine. But it, it, things have calmed down and it's quiet before yet a, another storm that will probably come not too distant uh, in the future. For now, the markets uh, haven't seen much of a response, uh, so we'll keep an eye on uh, the markets. Uh, again, uh, we had gold capped, not uh, unpredictably, at uh, the 1250 level early in the week, and uh, closing the week around 1230, and silver closing the week, um, holding above 17, around 1720 after uh, trading up, and again kept being capped at 1750 on Wednesday. Um, so we'll keep an eye on uh, both uh, the paper markets and the futures markets, as well as obviously the physical demand and the physical trends um, in the retail and physical markets, both in the, the U.S. and globally in the, the days and weeks to come. For the Doc and Eric Dubin, thanks for tuning in to this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets. Those individuals who are in charge of monetary policy around the world, I think they're very much aware of what is coming. When I've asked Federal Reserve Chairman in the committee about this, they never said, no, that's not going to happen. They used the word orderly. As long as it's orderly, it seems to be okay.